Johnson is sitting behind uh, John, you might remember, if you saw the video on uh, Pittsburgh shifting from wage tax to land tax, John was one of the people who testified in that. Um, I was going to have some uh, political dignitaries here, and the dignitaries had too much dignity. <laughs> so, um, so we don't have them. I, I don't know if they looked at the program and didn't want to talk about how Pittsburgh lost its land value tax, because there is a lot of scandal involved in that. And most politicians, even the clean ones, don't want to be in the room when we talk about scandal. Um, and um, the labor people, we have some labor people for the transit council, the, the transit session that Rick Ryback is doing, but I generally didn't get through to labor people either. I think that, that we need to reach out to labor people. But I think it's a long, long effort because they not only have to see the sense in your idea, but they have to trust you. And if you look at the history of the American labor movement, um, especially the early movement with Sam Gompers founding the AFL and Terence Powderly um, in the Knights of Labor, they had very terrible experiences with um, mostly with Marxists, but some with Georges too, that Marxists would join their organizations and when the American labor unions did not embrace Marxism, they attacked them from within. So there is a long history of um, labor learning not to trust people outside of labor. And so that might be part of why I failed to get many labor people here. The other might be that I haven't had as much energy as I used to have. You know, we get, um, how many people think that, that their generation is more intelligent than the previous generation or more? <laughs> than, uh, if you don't believe it's answers. Yeah. Well, I've noticed that every generation, especially when they're young, like my generation when we were young, when, you know, I, I grew up in the 60s, we thought we invented sex. <laughs> and um, every generation since then has seemed to think that, you know, we get derided as boomers now. And every generation seems to think that it's wiser than the previous generation. And yet no individual person thinks he was smarter 20 years ago than he is now. <laughs> You know, unless he unless he has Alzheimer's and knows it, <laughs> but but there is a there is a plane where your your wisdom gradually increases and your energy level gradually decreases, except that the decrease in energy level seems to accelerate toward the end faster than the increase of wit in wisdom. <laughs> and I'm too soon and I'm and too late smart. Huh? Too late smart. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I'm reaching that point of declining energy, so um, one of the things I wanted, before I get into talking about Pittsburgh, uh, one of the things I wanted to say is I'm really looking for apprentices who, who can uh, help plan the conference and, and um, hopefully take over planning the conference and, and become leaders in planning the conference. And so that's something that people here might might have an interest in, or if you go back and fan out to the Georgia's organizations that a lot of young people might be interested in. We have young people who think their generation is a lot smarter than ours and they want to go out and have their own conferences, but I don't see the, anybody from those conferences renewing year after year the way, the way we do. I mean, this is a conference for dedicated supporters. And... Uh, I'd like to see the, the dedicated supporters interacting with the, with the people who are just inspired for the first time, and, and that's um, part of what I'm hoping for. So I want to send that message out to when you go back home, is to get some people, young people involved with some of the older people, not necessarily with me, but with, with the established Georgias generally and do something of an apprentice program. 
I got involved in the Georgist movement in 1978. Um, I just separated with my wife, and she called me and said, there's, a, there's something in the paper. This guy, Bill Coyne, said, we've taxed everything as much as we can. We need to start shifting taxes to land. And um, I called Bill Coyne, and he was very excited about this. And I had been saying that it was a good idea, but I had no idea that there was such a thing as a Georgia's movement or anything. And he had me contact uh, Steve Cord, and I worked with Steve Cord for 10, 15 years helping him do what, what he does. And, and while I was doing it, I always thought, boy, I know, I understand this better than Steve Cord does. <coughs> but he kept getting victories. <laughs> and it was a while before I was getting any, so, so I think that the idea of apprenticing is not, is not that the people who are doing it now necessarily know more than you know, but it is that you will learn, you will learn, you will know more than you know now if you apprentice with somebody else. Even if you think you're, even if you think you understand how to do it better than they do, you will, you will understand better still if you apprentice for a while. And so that's, um, I was surprised that, you know, a lot of things I learned I didn't realize I had learned until years later. But uh, Steve just, his thing was, it was, this is not like political organizing, this is not like marching in the streets, this is like being a salesman. And you... You talk to somebody and they either buy it or they don't. And if they don't buy it, you move on, talk to somebody else. And there were 67 cities and, and uh, 50 of them never bought it, but 17 did. And that's, you know, that, and the 17 are, have done much better than the, than the 60 that, or the 50 that didn't. So, um, so that's that general lesson. In terms of Pittsburgh and how we had, is this echoing a little bit? Should I turn it down a little? Yeah, it's like a radio. It sounds like a radio. Good. Don't shake it. It's perfect radio. Don't break it. Okay, I was just hearing a little bit of echo feedback. Um, with Pittsburgh, we got it, we first got it in 1913. And before that, there were, we not only didn't have land tax, but there were special tax break provisions for large estates. So if you had a large estate, you could get it zoned agricultural or rural. And it was like clean and green exemptions today. Clean and green exemptions are just awful for the same reason. Is that only, they only go to rich people. And a lot of places that get a clean and green exemption ought to be the place, are the places that ought to be developed so that the development actually leapfrogs over the place that gets a de a, an exemption into areas that should not be developed. So the, the exemption, you know, getting an agricultural assessment means you get assessed at what the farm use value is. It doesn't do the rural farmers any good because the market value is the farm value if it's a, a, a agricultural area. It's the suburban farmer who gets a big tax break because the agricultural value is way less than the market value in the suburbs. So what happens is the suburbs leap over the exempt agricultural value. We had something very similar to that in Pittsburgh. We had these very large estates, and we had um, extremely high rents. Rents and this is when Pittsburgh was known as the Smoky City. This is when executives brought three sh three white shirts to work, and changed every time they had to go to a meeting. They would change their shirt because their shirt would turn gray as the day went on. Um, this is when you know, there are pictures where you, you take a picture from here and you couldn't see the other side of the river, um, and it was not. Foggy, or it was just it was just smoke. And what years and are we talking about? We're talking about around 1900. And in 1906, Pittsburgh had the second highest rents in the United States after New York City. Well, the rents obviously were not high because it was such a great place to be. 
It was high because if you wanted to work in these mills and make this money, you had to pay this rent. You had no choice. Uh, people don't seem to realize how high urban rents were before the automobile came. And that when people badmouth the automobile, they don't understand that the automobile gave people economic freedom, not from city taxes. In the, in the early 1900s, taxes were higher in the suburbs than they were in the cities because the suburbs had brand new sewers and infrastructure to build and new schools to build. And the cities had all that stuff pretty well paid off. But the rents were much, much higher in the city. The land prices were much, much higher in the city. So the flight to the suburbs was not to escape taxes, it was to escape rents. And it wasn't to escape poverty because in those early days there would be pockets of poverty, but there would be really rich areas in the city. And in general, the edge of the city was poorer than the center of the city. So, and which is how it is in Europe because Europe never really became car dependent as much as we did. So you look, you'll see that the center, you know, that Paris or Lyon or, or Berlin or London, it's very expensive to live in the heart of the city, and it's, the, it's cheaper as you go further out, and then as the automobile changed all that, so I don't know if that's true anymore. That was true in the 1950s and 60s at least. Um, but people don't understand that one of the reasons people, Americans love the automobile is that it saved us from rack rent. And any time we talk about getting away from dependence on the automobile, it's a good opportunity to say to them, you got you got to take on what causes rack rent in order to do that. But Pittsburgh did that, and by 1925, the millage rate was only twice as high in buildings as it was on land. But 80% of the revenue came from buildings because this was before the automobile, so land values were very high compared to building values, and on top of that, the millage rate made it so, so 80, and there were no other taxes. There was property tax, then there was land and building tax separate, and the only other revenue that the city of Pittsburgh had in its budget was wharf rentals which if you tied up, it's mostly coal barges at that time, but if you, if you wanted to dock a barge along any of the city wharfs, you had to pay a wharf rental. Well, a wharf rental is another form of land value tax. So it's actually slightly higher than 80% land value. Um, but not much, because wharf rentals weren't a big revenue item in the budget. But it was enough that uh, that it made it rational for everybody got to park their, their barges on the same terms because the wharf rental was a fixed fee and if, if the wharfs were getting crowded they raised the fees. But anyhow, that happened and then Pittsburgh began to lose population for the same reason all northeastern cities began to lose population which was that the automobile was making it possible to move out of the city. And the richest neighborhood back then back when we were the Smoky City, was a place called Swickley. And Swickley is down the Ohio River, which means it's west of the city, which means it's upwind of the city. So the richest neighborhood was not only upwind of the city, but the word Swickley is an Indian word, I forget which tribe, but it means sweet water. So Swickley had the best water and the best air in the area, and it became the richest place in the area. Uh, we have other rich places, but they're newer. Uh, Fox Chapel, Upper St. Clair, Mount Lebanon, they're all rich places around Pittsburgh that they are all newer. They're post-automobile, and they're pretty much post-cleanup, because Pittsburgh cleaned up. Um, they were going to clean up when the Great Depression hit, and they delayed it until after World War II, and then they very aggressively cleaned up the city. Um, but when we got land value tax in the first place, we had the Association of Realtors in support of it. They were called the Board of Realtors back then. They changed their name because everybody thought that the Board of Realtors 
was a government functionary. It sounded like, it sounded like a government board. Um, but they had the Chamber of Commerce in support of it. They had a number of business groups, conservative groups, that were in support of it. And we tend to think of this as, you know, the rich versus the poor or whatever, but richer people saw the wisdom in this, and business people saw the wisdom in this, and they got it passed. And the only time Henry George's name was brought up, this is, this is in Percy Williams wrote a, a, um, a paper called Pittsburgh's Land Value Tax, Its History and Experience, and he said it was opponents of the land value tax that brought up Henry George. They said, this is the discredited, you know, theories of Henry George. And the supporters of land value tax just said, that's an appeal to prejudice. So we didn't win by invoking the name of Henry George. We won by deflecting the other sides invoking the name of Henry George. But we got that far and then um, in and as often happens, as happened in Australia, as happened in other Georgia's places, instead of defeating the land value tax head on, they got centralized government to just start displacing city government functions. So they created school districts and separated the school tax from the city tax, and the school district didn't have authority to do a land value tax. But the school budget was originally in the city budget. So when it was 80% of the revenue, that was city and school revenue. Now it's not 80% anymore, and it's probably like 30. But it's 30% of the city revenue. It doesn't, the school revenue is almost as big as the city revenue. And, um, and Bill Coyne, we'll talk about Bill Coyne because he's the topic of the banquet. Um, so I don't want to get too much into that, but Bill Coyne uh, started replacing building tax with land value tax again and started going up again. And uh, Jack Wagner replaced wage tax with land value tax. So we were, we were getting some pretty good momentum. And then there was a big assessment scandal and that, that scandal is probably the more, more interesting part of the story because scandals are always salacious. But there was a there was a, a cap, the, the assessing is done by the county. The assessing used to be done by the city. And Percy Williams, who wrote that story, was the chief city assessor until 1942. And somebody, or until 1948, I think, one of the two. But basically, what happened is some, some real estate interests sued on the grounds that they were facing double jeopardy because they had to appeal their assessments twice. The county assessment and the city assessment didn't always match. And even if they won the city assessment, they had to go and appeal the county assessment. And I, I don't see a problem with that, but the courts did, and they said that you have to, they, they said, well, we'll make the county assess. And the county, in or the compromise that was worked out was that the county had to adopt the city of Pittsburgh standards. So the law became that counties of the second class, which Allegheny County is the only county of the second class, counties of the second class had to assess land and buildings separately. They had to assess often. They, they had all these, this stuff that put on them that other counties in Pennsylvania didn't have. And they immediately started ignoring land values so that by the by the late 60s the assessments were a very accurate reflection of what land values had been in 1948 which means that declining neighborhoods were now getting overassessed and um, you know gentrifying or I don't know if we didn't use the word gentrifying back then but improving neighborhoods uh, were getting under-assessed. And that was a problem that um, Steve knew how to do millage rates. He really didn't know how to tackle the assessment problem. He's tackling the, an assessment problem is much more difficult um, politically because nobody even wants to talk about assessing. And we kind of ignored it until 
Um, one of the assessors who I knew in high school um, contacted me and we started talking. She was upset because of all the corruption in the assessment office. And the corruption was um, at the top. Because the, at the bottom, they were all civil service, all civil servants. They had no political pressures on them. But at the top, there was, there was a lot of corruption going on and deals being made. And she got instructed to lower somebody's assessment in her district. And she said, I can't lower his assessment. He's in a plan. And all the houses are the same. And if I lowered his assessment, I'd have to lower the whole plan. And they said, lower the whole plan. She said, I can't lower the whole plan because there's been lots and lots of sales in that plan, and that plan is grossly underassessed. So they moved her to another district <laughs> and put somebody else in, and he lowered the whole plan. And she got put in a district that was the most underassessed district. It was the Quaker Valley School District, which is Sewickley and uh, other places that grew up around so quickly. So it's, it's rich and it's old money. And she started upping their assessments and they, the, the assessors started rejecting it, but she was like prevailing and embarrassing them. And at the same time, the city council members who were, um, they were being challenged in the primary by a reform guy in the primary. And we have a council system where you get, normally, you get two Democrats and one Republican, because Democrats are super dominant in Allegheny County. This is the one drawback of, of uh, this location, is that we're next to the train. But it's not too awfully bad. I think after the engine goes by, we should be fine. But um, the... The, the steel mill? Hmm? Is that going to steel? Well, it's hauling it's coal. A power plant. It's, coal it's, plant. it's probably a power plant. Because oh. the steel mills are mostly up that way. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's hauling, I, I'm guessing, coal to a power plant. And, or it could be coke, but I don't think it's. That's coke. Does it say coke? Yeah, every car. Yeah. The Clareton, which is upriver, is, the, I think, the world's largest coke plant. And what coke is, is basically baked coal. They, they bake it in a, they bake it in an oxygen deprived environment and it burns out the impurities without setting the coal on fire. And, um, and then once it's baked like that, it burns hotter. It's, it's kind of their, their, when they ran out of anthracite coal, this was their fix. Because anthracite coal burns hot enough for, for blast from we, we don't use blast furnaces anymore, but that's what we originally did was we made coke out of out of soft, dirty coal in order to get something that's comparable in heat to the anthracite coal. Not quite as heat hot, but, but better than the soft coal. Can I ask you a question? Do they still have tours of the mills? Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's not many mills that are open. And I worked in the mill. The mill's a pretty dangerous place. I don't know. I guess you could tour it, but you would have to be roped off from the really interesting. The really interesting places are the really dangerous. I was working in the mill, and and our our group had nothing to do. We were the millwrights were are like the repair people, and we had nothing to do. So I wandered off into another part of the mill, and I was totally unfamiliar with the mill. And I'm walking around a corner. And just as I walk around the corner, this giant ingot, an ingot is like probably 50 tons, or I don't know, it's, 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 it's the size of a small truck and it's solid steel. And it passes over me being held by a magnet. And it passed over me and I went, oh. And then, and then people came and started screaming at me because I had walked under this thing, and I said, well, I have my steel-toed boots on. <laughs> but I never, went, I never went wandering in the mill again after that. Um, 
But getting back to the, the assessment scandal, the, this woman had, there were actually four, four people who were turning whistleblower, and I'm the only person who knows who all four, I don't know anymore, I forget, but I'm the only person who knew who all four of them were. But everybody knew who this one was because she would call them crooks right in an appeals hearing. And um, she had a seniority of 83. Well, the, the corrupt Democrats got defeated in the primary. And one of the primary candidates was a very weak candidate, and the other one was a reasonably strong candidate. And what happened is after that, the Republicans won. So for the first time, we had two Republicans and one Democrat. And the two Republicans teamed up with some of the assessors, the ones who hadn't just gone to jail, because the scandal <laughs> ended up with people being convicted and some of them sent to jail, some of them being let off because they resigned from a, the, the Board of Assessors. And the highest ranking assessor who, who didn't get indicted um, wanted to get even with this woman Mm -hmm. and also hated land value tax. He testified against land value tax several times, and he was, he was um, the head of the Association of Realtors in Pittsburgh. And what, did, what was his argument? Um, his, argu his argument was the elderly poor property owner. He would read bleeding heart letters from elderly poor property owners, and, and even the city council members um, in the public hearing, one of them turned to the elderly people in the room and said, he's using you to get out of paying his fair share. So they, they kind of saw through that. But he got, he got a private company to um, take over the assessing. And he instructed that assessor, that, that, um, that company, to lay off 85 assessors and use their own people. And guess, how, guess what the, insur the uh, seniority of the whistleblower was? 83. Yeah, it was 83. So she had a seniority of 83. If you lay off 85, you know, if one person dies or goes on retirement or, or quits and moves away, if you laid off 85 and her seniority is 85, as soon as that happens, you've got to rehire her. So they left themselves a little bit of a cushion. <laughs> But the assessors understood the things in this, this out-of-town company didn't, and the people they hired were appraisers, not assessors. And appraisers know a lot of things that assessors don't know. But they don't know assessing. So, you know, assessing is an art of looking at a lot of, a lot of houses at once and looking at a lot of data and figuring out a, a, a big overall pattern. An appraisal is looking at very closely at one property and drawing from the other data. But assessing is, is much more individual focused and it doesn't do as good a job. You can't use appraisal techniques to appraise hundreds of thousands of properties. You just can't do it. You, it the cost, it, it's, you know, a, an appraisal costs way more than an assessment per unit. So they basically botched it, but they botched the land values on purpose because they, this guy who was the head of the assessment board now instructed them to assess land as, according to how it had been grandfathered in on zoning. So my house at the time, um, they assessed my land at $7,200, but a vacant lot right next to my house was assessed at $900. And the reason for that, they said, was, well, the zoning does not allow the owner of that lot to build on it. And it says, well, it doesn't allow me to build on it either. And they said, yeah, but you already have a building, so your land value is higher. And I said, well, that's, a, that's part of the building value. In fact, you know that vacant, when they passed that zoning law in 1956, there was a house on that vacant <laughs> lot. And when that house got torn down, 
the zoning variance got torn down too. That shows that the variance was in the building. And everybody I've talked to agreed with that except the people who worked for the assessors. So they were pulling this off and we were not on top of it. I was not on top of it because I was locked into a battle with the, uh, they were trying to pack, get a stadium tax to build those two new stadiums. And we defeated the stadium tax and they built the stadiums anyhow. And, um, and the, the assessors were represented by the service employees union who was, and that was, uh, the woman in charge of it was Rosemary Trump, and she was, she was challenged for her, for the president of her local, she was challenged by somebody who said she was doing too much in politics and not paying enough attention to her constituents, and they were embroiled in this big battle, so nobody really focused on fighting this company, and they basically got away with it. And, um, and they eventually got rid of the guy who was who caused it, but the current uh, county executive, even though he's he's not complicit in making the assessments bad, he doesn't want to touch them. And um, there's a saying in Pittsburgh or in Pennsylvania that that no county commissioner has ever s survived a reassessment. You know that you do a reassessment and you get removed from office. Well, one of the reasons for that is that they'll avoid doing reassessments for a long, long time, and then they say, and then they get sued, and their, their assessments are 30 years out of date, or occasionally like 50 years out of date. So when they reassess, it's a huge shock to taxpayers, because you're, because you've been underassessed more and more every year for 50 years. So, you know, what, what we tried to get across is if you reassessed every year, that wouldn't happen, but, uh, but that has not prevailed. So now we have a battle, and the battle is not, we're not going to win this battle in the sense that we're not going to win it by ourselves. Um, it's going to take, I think, Unions getting behind it, particularly the service employees union that represents the assessors. I think it's going to take um, all the overassessed municipalities um, coming together and getting behind it. Um, it's going to take uh, really good proposals to get, you know, really good proposals because if, if you make this a war, you're going to lose. You know, in other words, if we're going to go headlong, if we're going to vilify the, the power, the people in power, and we get them upset because they take this very, very personally and we turn it into that kind of, um, you know, um, class struggle mentality, war thing, I think we would get crushed. But if we appeal very diplomatically to the best people in I mean, we won land value tax. We had the Association of Realtors and the Chamber of Commerce on our side. And that was way back in 1911. Um, Josh Vincent had the Association of Realtors in Philadelphia on his side. So there is a way to appeal to this. And this brings us back to how much smarter I thought I was when I first started in doing this. My first approach was to hand things to people, get them on the streets and say, go into City Hall and send them a message. And, um, and Bill Coyne said, uh, don't do that. I said, well, I already printed these. He said, he said destroy them. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Don't do that. He said, I appealed, I've, I have like six of the nine council members agreeing with me on reason. They want to think that they did it because they agreed with it. They do not want to think that they, they don't want the public to think that they did it because we backed them into a corner. And so his point was backing them into a corner will cost you the victory. 
because they will fight you just to prove that you can't make them do it, even though they already agree with it. So, um, so that was one of the things I learned that uh, that I was that I was pretty dumb when I thought I knew it all. Um, so that's that's basically the the. Uh, the short end of the story, there might be questions about the details or stuff. Um, the assessor who got laid off went to Florida and she's now a floor, uh, an assessor in Palm Beach and making three or four times what she was making here. So, um, so it ended happily for her. Um, and I don't, don't quite know how to tackle this by myself, but I think it's it's going to be a lot of coalition building, but it's not going to be the kind of coalition building that you that you see in the newspapers. I think this is always going. To, I think we're relegated to the fact that that land value tax is difficult enough to understand. It's easy enough to understand for the people who really want to understand it. It's not hard at all if you want to understand it, but it's. It's something that's easy to understand if you're a problem solver. It's not something that's easy to understand if you're a justice warrior. Because justice warriors need enemies more than they need solutions. And, uh, you know, if, if, they, if they can't rail against the people who are under-assessed, they, they just can't get excited about it. So, and, uh, and John Robeson is probably the exception because he's excited about it and he's always been a justice warrior. So, hooray for John Robeson and his willingness to, to get into problem solving mode, which he, which, he, which he does often despite his very um, justice warrior approach to the things he, he does both, and I, it's rare to see people do both. Most people either either want to. F Most people would rather fight than win. <laughs> and John is John wants to win, and he has he's not shy about fighting, but he at least wants to win. And wanting to win is very very different from wanting the other people to lose. So. That's the thing that, that we have as our, that's really our strength. It, it, sometimes it seems like our weakness because we're out of step with the prevailing, um, you know, the identity politics of the left is, is I'm a victim because I'm a woman or a minority or a, or a uh, gay or, or transsexual or a religious minority or whatever. And the, and the identity politics of the right is I'm a victim because I'm a taxpayer and I, or I'm a self-employed businessman. Or, they, they all have their own victim identities. And neither one of them, <coughs> neither side is really focused on solving problems. And we are. And that puts us completely out of step with the political mainstream. But when you step away from the cameras, and you get into the little city council chambers, those people are elected to solve problems. And we have a solution. So I think, I think we have a, a big shot at it. Um, so that's, that's it. Again, the, the company that did Pittsburgh's bad assessment Sabre Systems and Services also was contracted to do a reassessment in Albany. Now, the Albany assessment that they did in 1995 was the first time Albany had been reassessed since 1940. And so it was rather difficult. So what they did is assign a flat 15% value to the land on every single parcel. Uh, uh, fortunately, we've had an assessment since then, which is a little bit better. But the main thing I want to point out, since Herb Barry is here, 
is the best article uh, that I have read about how Pittsburgh was sabotaged <laughs> is written by Herb Barry. And everybody should know about that article as a quick way to understanding what happened in Pittsburgh. Is that Thanks, stand up. Herb. Herb, stand up. I didn't uh, call attention to her very because he's at these conferences all the time. He's another local, but I didn't think of, you know, I thought of John. Well, John's a local and he's never here. You know, he's never at the conferences. John and Harold and Rob, but Herb is a local and he's at these conferences often. But do you, re do you remember anything about the article, Herb? Well, it's, 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 it's kind of have the word irrational in it, I think. <laughs> Come to the mic, sir. The, um, the other interesting thing, um, it kind of demonstrates that this guy in charge of the, uh, the guy who was the chief assessor, um, that he wasn't too bright because Clair Clairton, Duquesne, and McKeesport also had land value tax. And he didn't sabotage the land assessments in Clareton, Duquesne, and McKeesport. He only sabotaged them in Pittsburgh because he had properties in Pittsburgh and he knew about Pittsburgh's land value tax. I don't think he even realized that the other cities in Allegheny County had a land value tax. So their systems are just running along fine. Their assessments, their assessments for land value were, were fairly rational. Um, when Sabre Systems when it was first announced that Sabre Systems was going to take over the assessments, um, I called Ted Wartney and I said, well, do you know anything about this company? And he said, not a whole lot. And he said, well, I said, well, can they, can they do a good assessment? He said, they can do as good an assessment as the county wants them to do. Which I thought was a very cryptic way of saying, uh, if they do a bad assessment, it's, that's, it's because that's what, that's what they were instructed to do. Um, and, uh, but they're gone. I think Sabre Systems is, they're either out of business or they're no longer assessing. The calendar Sabre? I, I'm pretty sure Sabre Systems has, has given up on assessing. They still do. Sabre, before they were assessors, they were municipal data processors. So a lot of, they, they do tax bills and payrolls and they do all kind of computerized work, especially for smaller municipalities that can't afford to have their own internal systems. Like the city of Pittsburgh and the county do their own, they have their own computer department, they do all that stuff themselves. But all the smaller municipalities hire outside firms to process that and I think that's, if I recall, that's what Sabre Systems started out as. And um, somebody said to me, the problem is that assessing is an art and a science. And art can hire science, but science cannot hire art. <laughs> In other words, if you, don't, if you don't have that artistic flair to do the job, you can't have a subordinate bring the, the artistic flair in and do it under your direction. You have to have the people with the artistic flair be in charge, the people with passion for doing it right be in charge, and they can hire computer geeks to do all the technical stuff. So that's um, my sense of it. Alan? Yeah, maybe I'm uh, too simple-minded or I'm too slow to figure out your explanation of how Pittsburgh lost the land value tax. I really like this uh, brochure and I share it with people and I explained how Pittsburgh had a land value tax, and then they said, well, how did, how did they lose it? And I, I still don't really know. I, I, I tell them, well, there were a few uh, parking lot owners that didn't like it, and they got the city council to turn it over. But I guess I need to get the guy who yeah. wrote this to write a new version <laughs> and explain to me in black and white how Pittsburgh lost yeah, the they, land value tax. Um, and maybe you could re-explain it for uh, this simple... Well, let me, let me make the connection uh, as to why, because repealing the tax is a follow-up to the bad assessments. And what happened was, um, this was kind of a perfect storm, because it was, not only was I 
in the stadium tax battle and the SEIU president was in her battle for keeping her job. But the mayor um, who I was fighting on the stadium tax was defending land value tax and somebody was running against him who was beating him over the head with land value tax and never got anywhere until these bad assessments came in and he was able to grandstand on that. But um, eight of the nine council members, when they voted to a repeal, they repealed nine to nothing. But when they voted to go back to conventional property tax, eight of the nine said, if we can get the assessments straightened out, we would, would, not, we would have gone back to land value tax. And the one who, would, who didn't say that was the one who was running against the mayor. And anything the mayor was for, he was against. So, and he defeated the mayor. And then he died several months later. So it was, it was one of those, wasn't in office for very long. But he, um, but the, the, the eight of the nine council members, right in the municipal record, um, defended land value tax and said it's these awful assessments and we really regret having to do this. But the, the assessment, I mean, if you have two properties right next to each other and the land is assessed nine times as high on one as, the, as it is the next door, then that's just not rational and there's no way you can defend that. And, um, but we didn't have the resources to take them to court. And I didn't have the expertise to take them to court, so. Uh, going oh. forward, uh, it, with your zeal about getting good assessments, how are you going to deal with this volatility in the property market, especially now some of these ultra-rich people that put their property in the market for a year and then they have to drop it 500,000 or even in some cases a million. So these property values are going up and down. Well, when we had land value tax, we didn't have volatility in our property market. Yeah. And in the Great Depression, land values in the city of Pittsburgh fell 9%. Yeah. You know, in, in Los Angeles, I think it was like 50. I forget whether Los Angeles or, or Detroit was the highest. But, 80 but, places. But it was, a, it was a massive drop in most of the country. And, Washington, D.C., which was the boom town of the Depression, um, land values fell a little more than they did here. So, um, you know, Sue was just telling me to wrap up, so uh, Nate and John Robeson. Uh, I was just going to say that I had read that um, having the county uh, botch the city assessments was a really old uh, scheme. And that I read, I read that uh, a long time ago, uh, the uh, people had gotten the idea that they'd have the Allegheny County ruin the uh, assessments for Pittsburgh, and um, this was, I think, in the early 1900s, and then, um, or maybe maybe mid, and that um, a bunch of uh, Georgists in this Pennsylvania legislature. Uh, rallied to pass a law specifically stating that um, that Pittsburgh would Pittsburgh already had the ability the the authority to maintain its assessments, but they passed a law specifically saying that that Pittsburgh would always manage their own assessments and that, mm. and so I was just wondering if you had heard that I just I no, but I'm through. interested in if you can find that. Okay, yeah, I was reading through old old newspapers and stuff. And then John, because I, I want to introduce uh, Josie, um, where's we, the new president of the Schaffenbach Foundation. And, uh, and we also have to do some housekeeping announcements, please, sir. Okay, with uh, John, go ahead and... We, we, they have an interesting opportunity to do something about both the land the loss of the separate value of land and the lousy assessment of land. And one of the major assessment impacts of, of land value is from transit. Act 82, which enables most of the funding for 
Pennsylvania Public Transit. This is all over the state. Philly and Harrisburg and Erie as well as here is expiring in 2020 and has to be replaced. And the way it's done now is through the Turnpike Commission and nobody likes it. Not the Turnpike Commission, not anybody. But nobody has a clue what to do about it. And it would seem that uh, estimating the impact of transit on land value and putting a tax on that might be the way to deal with the crisis and the lack of a way to fund public transit. Here, here. Well, that's, and, and when Rick or I get talks about transit, it will undoubtedly come up again, and we'll have some local transit people here as well. Um, Josie is Foss, right? Is the new head of Schalkenbach. Um, Gib, you want to introduce her? Sure. Because uh, I've heard nothing but good things about her, but I, <laughs> I've heard them secondhand, so Gib knows more firsthand. Thank you, Dan. I've got probably one one-hundredth of uh, what Dan has told you. My name is Gib Helverson. I'm the president of Robert Schockenbach Foundation. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. Many foundation people are here. Welcome, all of you. I've been coming to these events for 35 years. My attendance hasn't been perfect, but uh, I can certainly see some old friends in the, in the audience. I'd like to first, before I go off on uh, other tangents, uh, Mark Sullivan, he is, is he still in the room? There he is. Mark is, <laughs> Mark is recently retired from the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. He was the glue that kept us together for many, many years. We certainly thank him and thank him for the, the toil in the vineyards on behalf of the George's cause. I'll introduce Josie in a few minutes. Uh, she is our new executive director. And this is a case in which we, we tend to think that, uh, that we have met all the Georgists in the universe and they all come to these events, but that isn't <laughs> quite true. Before I go too far into that, uh, it, both Henry George and Robert Schockenbach started out life as typesetters. They went in different directions. Uh, Henry George became a printer and then a newspaper editor, and, and of course he, all, he wrote the one book that we're all very familiar with, Progress and Poverty. Robert Schockenbach, on the other hand, went into printing, eventually becoming a, a company, uh, an executive of a printing company, then into publishing, and lastly he was the president of a consortium of uh, printers and publishers. At the, at the end of his career, he was the uh, president of the Manhattan Single Tax Club. And we all know what that means. That was a very common description and very common club around the turn of the century. That was something that uh, people could relate to. But now, when you say single tax, nobody knows what you're talking about. It's an alien term. We've moved on to land value tax, uh, annual ground rent, uh, value capture, and my favorite from, John, from David Lincoln of the Lincoln Land Foundation is ethical taxation. I think All that, right. uh, that leaves it pretty open, but it gets people's attention. We decided that we wanted to hire a Georgist, and uh, you never know quite where you're going to find one. And that's how we found Josie, that uh, she was not coming to these events. But we found her nonetheless. But before I get into that, I'd like to give you just a little story that I think many of you can relate to. That I used to live in Madison, Wisconsin. And we had a botanical garden that had fallen into disrepair. And there was a fundraiser, and it got spruced up, and then there were tours of the grand opening, 
And one of the people who was giving a tour was this young lady, and that uh, she was a, a graduate student in agronomy. Well, that tells you land, okay, well, that's why she's there at the botanical gardens. And then I noticed that her first name was Hope, and I won't give away the story too quickly on what her last name was, but many Georgists tend to name their children after something that reflects a, a better future. So Hope was a natural uh, name for a girl, but it did give uh, some degree of upliftingness. Well, her last name was Finkelstein. For those of you that have been coming to these events for many, many years, her father was Phil Finkelstein, and he had been a, an assistant to the mayor of New York, and he, was, he gave this organization some gravitas, and I come up to her and I said, uh, by any chance is your father Phil Finkelstein? And she said, well, yes. And I said, well, I'm so-and-so, and I'm a Georgist, and I think you probably know what that is. Oh, yes, I've read Progress and Poverty, and I've talked with my father about that many years. Well, her father had died uh, middle age, and we certainly missed him, probably not quite as much as Hope and her family missed him. But I ta was talking about her father, and then she, she turns to me and she says, well, how did you know that my father was, was Phil? And I said, well, Hope, this is, this is Wisconsin. I said, uh, Finkelstein is not a real common name around here. <laughs> and, and she looks at me kind of puzzled and she said, really? In Manhattan, there's two pages of us in the phone book. <laughs> So you never know when you're going to run across a Georgist when you least expect it. I wasn't, uh, had I only known her name was Hope, I would never have uh, probably pushed myself on her to find her Georgist credentials. But that was how we ended up with Josie, that we had made the determination that we wanted a Georgist for the, for the foundation. So where do we find one? We went through many, many resumes and Josie and a number of other people had gone to some length and explained that yes, they had read the book in graduate school, and yes, they were familiar with it, and yes, they thought it was a good idea, but they have to make a living. So you move on and you do other things, but Josie was, her, her personality and her resume just stood out so much that we had to hire her. We are looking forward to a long and prosperous, mutually beneficial relationship. She has only been on the job for three and a half months, and she has given us a much, a new set of eyes as to what the possibilities are. And sometimes that's what you need, is someone from the outside, even though she's a Georgist, someone from the outside that can stare at your situation and say, maybe we ought to do this. So now I'm going to introduce our, our new executive director, Josie Foss. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so my personality better be great because Gib has just built it up. Uh, but anyway, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, that's good enough. No, yes? Louder. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm Josie Foss. I'm the new executive director of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. And I just want to start by saying that I am so extremely pleased to be here with you tonight and to be at this event. Uh, as you can imagine, I have heard quite a bit about the CGO from the board and from my colleagues at the foundation. Uh, as you can see, I, I have the green badge of honor as a newbie, so I'm going to be taking it all in. Uh, but one of the things that I've heard a number of times from, from different people is that this is a bit like a family reunion. It is. And yes, and I think Mike even said that to me tonight, so I'm just <laughs> reinforcing it. Uh, but I, I think that's really great, and I obviously know that I'm a newcomer to the family. Uh, so I wanted to spend just a couple minutes telling you guys, although Gib did give me a very gracious introduction, what sort of brought me to this point. Um, so my background is I've studied biology and urban planning and public policy. And so obviously the ideas of Henry George were something that I had encountered and I thought, this makes a ton of sense, like why are we not doing this? But then 
life happens and, and you move on. So, uh, so it was something that I had sort of come in contact with. I had thought it was really cool. Um, had worked a lot in sort of the environmental policy space. So really focused on site remediation, on preventing sprawl, on making the public whole from environmental damages and those sorts of things, which as you can imagine are, are integrally related to the ideas of Henry George. There's a lot in common there. Uh, and so that's always been sort of core to my interest. From there, I went on to kind of get into development and administration. Um, learned a lot. I think I got some good tools that I can bring to the position at the Schockenbach Foundation, um, which is really great. Uh, but my last position was at the Institute for Advanced Study. Has anybody heard of this place? Okay, some people. The board of the Schockenbach Foundation has heard of it. That's good. Uh, so it's in Princeton. It's not part of the university. Uh, but it's basically the tippy top of the ivory tower. It's where sort of the world's most renowned astrophysicists and strength theorists and theoretical mathematicians come to walk around in the woods and think great thoughts and it's a really nice place um, and I had a great job there uh, but one of the things that always kind of bothered me about that position was that those great thoughts by and large are really detached from our everyday lives um, you know it's not that they're unimportant and it's certainly I'm not in any way trying to diminish the pursuit of expanding human knowledge because I think that is fundamentally important and it is kind of what makes us human is that we can do these things uh, but for me personally I wanted to dedicate my own efforts to something that I felt was more boots on the ground and was more about changing this world in this moment and I have to be honest uh, when Trump got elected I felt like that became a lot more salient for me and I, I think I'm not the only person <laughs> although uh, so so it was something that I kind of sat with for a while my son and I started volunteering because it really hit him very hard that this had happened uh, but it wasn't really enough it was a good start but I realized that you know we spend so much time on our careers and our jobs and to be able to dedicate that time and that effort and frankly the education that we've all worked years and years to get to making a difference is what I wanted to do with my life and with my career. And so going back to the Institute for just a moment, it was the home in America of Albert Einstein. So I think a lot of people think he was at Princeton University, he was actually at the Institute. And there was a quote of his, and I actually Googled it this morning because I didn't want to get it wrong, and I now think it may not have been a quote of his in point of fact, but we're gonna go with it. <laughs> and I think you've all heard this one. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And that might seem detached from this decision, but it was really core to why I wanted to be part of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation and part of the Georges community, is that I feel like we're in this pivotal and really salient moment in our history. And if we're going to try and attack the problems that we're facing with that same toolbox that we've been using for years and years, that is the definition of insanity because it's gotten us to this point. And when I think about the ideas of Henry George, and I know you guys feel the same way, they just make so much sense, <laughs> you know? And you wanna see them implemented because you know that they would make a world of difference and they would do a world of good. And so in the Schockenbach Foundation, I recognize the opportunity to stand for something and to really get behind these ideas. And I, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of older Georgists is, uh, you know, we've always known that these are great ideas and they maybe haven't been implemented to the point that we've wanted or we've seen things rolled back and we're talking about Pittsburgh, you know, where it's been implemented and then it's been undone and it's discouraging. And I don't think that the younger generations are any smarter than the older generations, but we've got the energy and I think this is our moment. We've got to engage these people. And so I want to see, you know, Sue told me I didn't have to wear my first-timer badge. <laughs> but I'm up here with my first-timer badge as a badge of pride because we need a lot more green badges in this room, right? We need a lot of people who find this stuff <laughs> as compelling as we do. And, you know, one of the things having studied biology and studied public policy is that scientists for a really long time thought that logic was going to prevail, right? You'll explain it to people and they'll see that it makes sense and they'll just agree with you. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. People are emotional creatures. In fact, Paul and I were talking about that at the beginning of this happy hour. Uh, you know, we've got to talk to people where they are. We've got to appeal to them 
in a place that's not just logical. It's not just about tax, which frankly is keeping some people up at night. I know I live in New Jersey, so it keeps me up at night. Uh, but you know, we've got to get to them at a more core level. And so since I've joined the foundation, I've been talking a lot with the directors and with colleagues, and I look forward to meeting all of you and speaking with all of you about you know, how do, how do we move the needle? Like, we've got to move the needle. This is the moment. These ideas have always been important, and in this moment, they are vitally important. So let's get them out there. And so the board and I are working on a strategic plan. And the strategic plan is actually turning out to be really cool. And that's great, right? Uh, so the foundation is going to look a little bit different than it has in the past. And I'm very fortunate to have inherited an organization that Mark has stewarded for many, many years with incredible care and love. And so, you know, a strategic plan is never to cast aspersions on what came before. It's to try and move forward in the most productive way that we can. And so, what you've always known about the foundation and loved about it and appreciated about it is going to remain. You know, we're going to be promoting the ideas of Henry George. We're going to be putting publications out there. That stuff is not going to go away. But you are going to see us trying to be more active in engaging and uh, working with communities and elected officials and really trying to get out there in the weeds and see how much of a difference we can make. You know, that that's, that's where the excitement is at this moment with this board and this organization. And I have to be honest, that makes me so happy. Uh, because that was the leap of faith that I took by taking on this role because I really want to see these things happen and I see the Schockenbach Foundation as having some critical mass and having the history and really the dedication and the passion and so I'm so excited to be doing this work. Um, we do have a book table at this event. I hope you all will stop by. I'd love to get to talk to each one of you. Um, I know we've had a book table for many years. This year we're doing something a tiny bit different. Um, so we're actually going to be doing an auction. <laughs> and I'm mentioning this because it's something kind of fun, um, but I'm also mentioning it because part of our strategic plan is that we want to put all of our resources, everything that we can legally put on the web, we want to do so and we want to make it free. Because one of the things we need to do is remove that barrier to entry. Anybody who wants to see what we have needs to be able to see it just with an internet connection. Whether it's in a personal computer, it's at a library, it's at a community center, I don't want anybody who wants to know this stuff to have to pay a price that would be prohibitive. So we're doing a raffle. The prizes are really cool. Uh, but I'm not going to spill the beans because I want you guys to come to the table. Tickets are $2 each. All of the proceeds are treated as donations, and they're going to go towards this digitization effort. As you can imagine, we want to do it right, and that costs money. So. This is what we're doing. But really, I hope you'll stop by and just have the chance to talk to me, because I would love to learn from all of you. And I've been talking about this conference and how excited I am to be here, because I am new, and because you all are seasoned, and you can hopefully help me avoid some foibles, you know, and give me some heads up, and I absolutely want to hear what you have to say. So I would invite you all to stop by the table. I'm excited to be part of the Schockenbach Foundation at this moment in history, and I'm very excited to be here with you at CGO 2019. Thank you. I love that, because one of my frustrations was that, you know, we were very active until 1913 when, when the Georgist movement split between those who thought income tax would be a good substitute for land tax and those who thought it wasn't. And those who knew it was <clears throat> Well, there was a, the, yeah, it was, well, socialists pushed liked income tax, a minority of Georgists liked income tax, and the, and the land monopolists knew that they could survive income tax because as long as they were holding the land idle, they weren't generating any income. But, um, but what my sense of, of this was that the Georgist movement went into a monastic mode, that when the opportunity to push land value tax comes back again, we will have this core group of people who we've taught progress and poverty to, and, and we've done this. And when the opportunity comes again, 
will we'll have us here who are ready to do it. But we're not ready to do it because we've we've had such an internal focus for, for, 19, for since 1913, that's over 100 years. And I've always been frustrated with the idea that, that all um, the Henry George School, uh, Schalkenbach, Lincoln is much too much enamored with respectability to say anything that's, that might be unrespectable. But all of us have had this sense of, of being in our own ivory tower, of not being actively involved. So I'm just like, I can't imagine being more thrilled with, with a, a uh, presentation than I was with, with that idea that we would be more engaged. Um, we have some housekeeping things. 